Up until this point in the class, we've talked about building and validating prediction models, including behavior detectors. Models that infer a predicted variable from predictor variables. A couple lectures ago, we went into a little more detail of where the predicted variable can come from. But where do the predictor variables come from? Do they fall out of the sky? It's raining data, the data deluge. Do they come from the Office for Predictor Variables in Washington, DC? Man, I wish that office existed. Feature engineering is the art of creating predictor variables, and it's a major topic in its own right. At Teachers College, I teach a semester-long design studio in feature engineering. Well worth coming to Teachers College just for that course. Why a whole class? Well, feature engineering is the least well-studied part of the process of developing prediction models, but it's arguably the most important part. Your model will never be any good if your features, your predictors, aren't any good. Feature engineering is an art. It's human-driven design. It involves lore, unfortunately, rather than well-known and well-validated principles. It's hard. The big idea is how can we take the voluminous, ill-formed, and yet underspecified data that we now have in education and shape it into a reasonable set of variables in an efficient, effective, and predictive way. It's a process in its own right. You brainstorm features. You decide what features to create. You create the features. You study the impact of the features on the model goodness. Then you iterate on the features if useful, and then you go back to creating more features or brainstorming more features until you feel like you're done. Brainstorming features can be more or less formal. IDEO, which is one of the nation's leading design firms, has some tips for brainstorming. Defer judgment. Encourage wild ideas. I like wild ideas. Uh, build on the ideas of others, stay focused on the topic, have one conversation at a time, don't split into like lots of groups doing lots of stuff, be visual, um, and go for quantity at first rather than quality. I like quantity. I want to point something out. Building on the ideas of others doesn't just have to be people nearby. There's a huge literature out there of features that people have tried and what's worked or failed to work for a range of problems. Read papers from researchers working on similar problems and see what you can use. On hard projects, my research group often meets as a team over pizza and beer to brainstorm. On easier projects, sometimes one person will brainstorm solo, and then discuss their features with another person who will offer further suggestions. Deciding what features to create, well, there's never infinite time. You have to decide because you can't make everything. And there's a trade-off between the effort needed to create a feature and how likely it is to be useful. Sometimes the best you can do for how likely it is to be useful is look at whether similar features have been useful for similar problems, and use your best intuition. It's worth biasing in favor of features that are different than anything else you've ever tried before because it explores a different part of the space. How do you create features? Well, there's three things that my lab does and there's innumerable other solutions. Microsoft Excel, really good for prototyping features and seeing what you're doing. Google Refine, now called OpenRefine, has some alternate features that are really nice. And third, Distillation Code, the scalable solution, but harder to check yourself or explore. What we often do is we'll create features in Excel to prototype them, and then once we've determined they work, we build distillation code and check that our distillation code comes up with the same thing as the Excel. Excel's got a lot of useful tools for this, including pivot tables, which are great for aggregating data and getting the average, min, max, and standard deviation. VLOOKUP, which is great for translating from aggregations, student level data for instance, back to action level or clip level data. So an example might be, how much faster is the current student action than the average student attempt? Sorry for the typo. How much faster is the current student action than the average student attempt on the current skill? So let's take a look at how you can do that. So we have a student, we have a skill, and we have a time. So we've got a bunch of different students, a bunch of skills, a bunch of time. So we first create a pivot table from all the data. Uh, we go to the insert and click pivot table. And then we uh, click OK. Often it'll come up with the right thing by default, but check to see if it's got the right variable range. Then we create a pivot table. So in this case, we're going to put as row labels the skill and as values the time. And you'll note that we're going to do both the average and the standard deviation of time. Um, and you can see when we right click on values, we get this value field settings option. We then get um, a set of variables. Um, so for each row, for each uh, skill in this case, we get an average time and a standard deviation of time, which we then select all of and paste special values, and uh, click down below and copy out the data. Now we have two copies of our data, one in the pivot table, one outside. This is important because you can't and probably don't want to do a VLOOKUP on a pivot table itself. Then we go back to the original spreadsheet and we do a VLOOKUP. 
let's talk about this VLOOKUP here. I know I'm kind of racing through this. My idea here is you'll be able to come back and look at this and then maybe see what you can do with this to be able to learn this on your own to some degree. So you VLOOKUP and you're trying to find the skill in that table of skills. And you have that table of all of the skills, their average and their standard deviation. You take the second thing and you put false. Last thing in VLOOKUP should always be false. There's more about that, but for every practical intended purpose of what you'd be doing, false is what you want there. You then create the standard deviation, and that's the exact same thing, except we're looking at the third column of that table back there, rather than the first one. And finally, you create unitized time by taking the current time minus the average time for the skill, divided by the standard deviation. And this gives you how much faster or slower the current student action is than the average time for this skill. So for some further resources about how to use Excel, here are a few I like. Uh, go check this out on the lecture slides. Definitely worth looking at these. Other useful things you can do in Excel? There's actually a bunch of them. Count so far. You can create a count of how many times a thing has been seen so far in a student. Counts over the last n actions. How many times has a student done something like asked for help in the last five or three actions? Um, differentiating first attempts from subsequent attempts. Getting ratios between events of interest and cutoff based features. That's an if statement and a greater than less than. There isn't time to go through all these in great detail right now, but this is a powerful tool and we'll look at this in the uh, assignment. Another tool that's nice is Google Refine, recently renamed OpenRefine, which has functionality to make it easy to regroup and transform data. It can find similar names, real nice if you're looking at, say, student data. It can connect names to each other. It can bin numerical data. It can do mathematical transforms and it actually shows you the resultant graphs. It can do text transforms and column creation. All kinds of cool stuff. It also has functionality for finding anomalies or outliers. As well as functionality for whenever you've done some data distillation, you can automatically repeat the exact same process on a new data set. And this is really nice for cases where you complete a complex process and you want to repeat it exactly. It's so cool. Here are some videos you might want to watch later. They take about, I think, a half hour to watch. Definitely worth it. Another important step in feature engineering is feature iteration. Sometimes when a feature looks like it might be good, it's worth iterating on that feature, trying close variants to see if they do better. For example, let's say you have a feature, slow actions after hints, and you define slow action as an action taking over 20 seconds. It's plausible, but what if 30 seconds is a better cutoff? What if 30 second actions or longer after hints actually are a better prediction of student learning because these hints take 30 seconds to read and think through? There are a bunch of ways to accomplish this. There are a bunch of ways to test whether there's some better feature than what you've got. You could do it by hand. You could try 20, then 30, then 40, then 50, and try a bunch of stuff. You could do this programmatically. You could use Java or MATLAB or some other tool to try all, systematically all the options. 10 seconds, 11 seconds, 12 seconds, 13 seconds. My group has done this for some problems. Or you could use the Excel Equation Solver, which is a kind of neat tool that can do this. Um, here's some tutorials for the Excel Equation Solver. One tip that you might find useful. For recent versions of the Excel Equation Solver, it actually doesn't do too good a job of searching the space compared to the earlier versions. Multi-start option is something you can use to avoid local minima that can sometimes block the solver from even getting started. I'd like to share a few more thoughts on feature engineering. First, does feature engineering overfit? Well, it can. Which is why it's useful to remember, the true test of a model is whether it works on entirely unseen data. If you iterate on your features a lot and you're using cross-validated goodness the whole time, then the cross-value goodness will not be the true test of your model. The true test in your model will be either a held-out data set or a newly collected data set later on. One other thought on feature engineering. Your features come from somewhere. You can take a standard set of variables or pre-existing variables, and there's no question that's faster than engineering things. But thinking about your variables is likely to lead to better models.